Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dan Hughes. I'm going to be taking us through our demonstration today. We are going to be talking about selective post-processing utilizing DxO as well as the NIC collection. And, and I'm going to focus on um, I'm going to focus on control points primarily, but I do want to show you some really powerful tools that are built into Photolab uh, that are really, really neat. And then I'd also like to show you a, a one of the new color capabilities, color features that's built into DxO Photo Lab 3, and um, we'll, we'll go from there. So we are focusing on control points primarily, but there are some cool other tools that you can use in Photo Lab. And then also, if you launch the NIC plugins from Photoshop, uh, there's a brush capability where you're dealing with and utilizing layers, layer masks, and blending modes. Um, I have one person who's just informed me that their audio has not come through. Let me just type to that person really quickly, ladies and gentlemen, and then uh, we'll, we'll jump in. Um, Okay, let's see here, that should send. Audio comes through correctly. Okay, Milko, thank you very much. So sometimes what happens, ladies and gentlemen, is that uh, a connection isn't made properly. Um, oh, cool, Tom, you found it, okay. So sometimes the connection to these, the webinar system isn't made properly and you'll see my screen and you'll see things moving around, but you won't hear me. Um, if that were to happen to you, just log out of the webinar and log back in. Or if for some reason you uh, have audio now and it cuts out, this has happened before where you need to, you know, either give it 30 seconds or so and see if it comes back because sometimes there's just some latency in the connection and the audio is the first to go. Uh, and so what you do is just log out of the webinar after 30 seconds or a minute of waiting around for the audio to come back. Um, note that this webinar is being recorded as well, so if for some reason you got really frustrated or your internet connection wasn't good or something like that, you will be able to watch this webinar uh, afterwards. It will be posted on the NIC Software website as well as on the uh, NIC Software YouTube channel specifically. Now, if there are any questions, feel free to type them into the questions box there in your GoToWebinar control panel. For now, I'm going to minimize my GoToWebinar control panel so I won't see any of the questions come in because I want to talk to you about selective post-processing, starting out with DxO. So there's some really amazing uh, global adjustments that you can do to your images here within DxO Photo Lab. Uh, we, we do not have enough time to cover everything, uh, but two of the sort of most interesting capabilities in my mind uh, that sort of jump out right in the essential tools section is the DxO Smart Lighting and then uh, the DxO Clearview Plus. And um, where the DxO Clearview Plus kind of works for this image because it brings out some really interesting texture globally um, as we turn this off and on again. I'm gonna turn the DxO Smart Lighting on and then off again. Um, and you can kind of see what they're doing. So uh, the Smart Lighting tool, this little checkbox, which is typically gonna be on by default, uh, what it's trying to do is equalize the tones within the image. So here's the before and there's the after. So it kind of, it, it's unique to each individual image in terms of what it does to each photograph. But the idea is that it, it brings details out of shadows and it tends to, or it tries to bring details out of bright and highlight areas as well. And so this can be really great um, if you've got a photo that, um, didn't have ideal lighting when you shot it, but you did a good job making the picture, maybe retaining highlight detail in the photograph, um, this tool can really help to bring out shadow textures and highlight details, this DxO Smart Lighting. It kind of like relights the image, if you will. Uh, DxO um, Clearview Plus is a contrast and texture control, and I think it works nicely in this case on this photograph, but at its default setting, it's a little bit too strong. So um, I'm gonna actually just hide that side of the interface and bring, um, I can't bring that down any further, so I'm not gonna do that, but just so you can get a good sense of what's happening here, um, the original image had this really kind of beautiful open lighting, and with the DxO Clearview Plus, um, it's, it's kind of subduing that natural effect of the light, but it's bringing out textures and tones really beautifully. 
So um, I, I like what it's doing, but I think it's a little bit too strong. So I'm going to leave it on, but I'm going to take the intensity slider and I'm just going to bring this down to maybe 10 or 15. So it's a really subtle effect. But the, the other thing that both of these tools do, DxO Clearview Plus and the DxO Smart Lighting, is they help me to see and get a, a, a unique view and potential of the image. And oftentimes, I will turn these tools off and then use the local adjustments to kind of pick and choose where I'm going to be adjusting the lighting and how I'm going to be controlling the contrast and color. But the DxO Smart Lighting and the Clearview Plus are helpful for seeing the potential, even if you don't leave them on. Now, the last thing that I'm going to do here, I, for some reason, this little, not vignetting, but this corner up here is bothering me a little bit. So I'm going to go into the crop tool here, and I'm just going to crop the image really quickly. Um, I'm going to keep the original ratio, but I'm going to bring my tool in here, and I'm just going to crop this down. And if I crop it too far, I, I don't know if I actually can crop it here. I can. Let's just move it to here. I want to be careful of my you know, overall composition. Um, but I guess that's going to work just like that. So let's close that. That's going to apply our crop. And uh, let's move into our local adjustments, where if you follow me to the upper right corner of the uh, DxO <laughs> Photo Lab interface here, it opens up into the local adjustments section or tool, right? So it's highlighted in blue up there. And then note you'll also have a close, a reset button, and then a new mask. And um, in this case, because the default control with these uh, local adjustments are control points, you're going to see the control point buttons down here. But there are actually quite a few wonderful controlled local adjustment tools that you have. And to access them, you're going to right click somewhere on your image. And this little heads up display pops up, this little screen, um, and it allows you to choose which of your um, selective or local adjustment tools you want to use. That was weird. My photo lab got hidden. Um, so by default, it's going to be under control points, but there's an auto mask, there's a gradient filter, and then there's a, a sort of singular brush tool, which you can control like a standard brush, as well as an eraser, uh, a new mask button here. So you don't, if you're adjusting something up here in an image, you can actually just right click for that heads up dis display to come up. So you can click new mask as opposed to going down to the lower right corner. So the idea of these two tools, reset and new mask um, are to speed up your workflow. So with that, let's start with a gradient filter. So for anyone who is a Lightroom user um, or maybe uses masks in Photoshop, you're probably comfortable with and have used gradients before. Um, anyone who's not, basically what this tool allows us to do is create a linear gradient where um, wherever we click first, we'll have the most effect. And then wherever we drag to, so I'm clicking and dragging, we will have the least amount of the effect. And you can see that reflected in this sort of um, cyan or, or bluish looking uh, mask that shows up on the image here. So what I'm doing is I'm just clicking and dragging. And what's gonna happen when I let go is that the bulk of the effect is gonna be happening wherever I initially clicked. And then it gradiates, this nice linear gradient, um, so that there's almost no effect up here. Once I've clicked and dragged my gradient out, I'm able to then go into um, my, my brightness adjustments, so my light adjustments, my color adjustments, and then my detail adjustments. And actually, you'll get used to this kind of interface because all of the local adjustments here within DxO, or within PhotoLab 3, have these same controls. So, oops, as I click out of it. So what I wanna do is actually kind of burn the edge of the image down. So I'm gonna go ahead and darken the photo down, maybe a stop, stop and a half or so. And uh, by doing this, by just clicking on the brightness adjustment here and dragging it downward, now I have a gradient from the bottom of the image up. Right? In fact, if I take it too far, let's leave it really far, just for now. Oops, shoot. Sorry, I'm clicking around a whole bunch. So um, we've, we've adjusted our gradient there. I've actually accidentally clicked off of the gradient tool, but you can see that the gradient little function or icon is still there. And that's one of the beauties of using these local adjustments within PhotoLab is that it's it's parametric image editing. And these adjustments are accessible and adjustable 
anytime you want. You can come back to this image after you go back or you go and edit 50 other pictures or one other picture or whatever, and you can click on it and go back in and readjust. And so this is a really nice feature and a really nice capability um, simply because I can make my adjustments, make my decisions as I see fit, and then three days later, if I don't like them, I can come back in and adjust them however I see. Um, in fact, we'll, we'll do that once we've made some other adjustments on the picture. I like this burned edge that we have here. And now that I've done this, and um, oops, as I click around more, uh, now that I've burned that bottom edge in a little bit, I'm realizing that the whole left side of this image is a little bit brighter than I want it to be because the light is being driven from camera left. Right? And that's how it works. And I love the lighting that's, a, that's occurring on our subject here and on the door, but this seems a little bit out of control and a little bit uneven. So what we'll do is right click to bring up our heads up display. And then I'm gonna add a control point to that wall there. So I'll just click control point. And then um, the way control points work for anyone not familiar uh, is basically you click on the object that you wanna adjust and the control point makes the selection of that object based upon the tone, color, and texture that you drop the point on that's inside of the circle, right? So we're not making a circular selection, but rather making a selection inside of this circle. There's a lot of techniques that go along with these control points. I'm gonna show you a couple of them once we get into uh, the NIC plugins specifically. But for now, what I wanna do is just expand uh, that circle out around basically the entire portion of the wall that I want to adjust. And what's going to happen is the control point is going to make that selection for us so that I can just go into my exposure slider, bring that down a little bit, bring my contrast up, bring my uh, micro contrast up a little. And then I think I'm going to move into the color tools. So, so far, all we've adjusted were the light adjustment tools, which has all of these adjustments, exposure, contrast, micro contrast, clear view plus, and then highlights, midtones, shadows, and blacks. And you can okay, uh, you can reset um, at any time. You can reset any of these control points by just clicking this button here, and it's going to reset it back to its sort of neutral points. But for now, what I want to do is move into the color settings, and I want to increase the vibrancy, and I want to increase the saturation, because I kind of want the left side wall to match the right side wall. Um, and in fact, the, one of my favorite features of these localized adjustments, and it doesn't seem like this would be that impressive or that amazing, but because we're dealing with the raw data here, we also have access to the actual color temperature and the actual color tint, which means we can selectively white balance different areas within a picture, which is a hugely important control. If you start getting into uh, lighting situations where you have two different color temperatures, right, or three different color temperatures, or in this case, where we've made kind of a dramatic uh, contrast adjustment, and then I increase some of the saturation here or there. Um, I also wanted to warm up that wall a little bit so that this wall matches that wall just a touch more, right, and I think that it's looking pretty good right now, and in fact, if you ever want to see a before and after, you can click the compare button up here in the top portion of the interface, and you can see I'm clicking and holding the compare button, and uh, as I let go of the compare button, I see my after. All right, so next adjustment tool. It, the, it's funny, this image actually, you know, it's, it's a simple picture of a, a, a woman standing against a door with a wall, but there is all sorts of selective post-processing that we can do to help direct the viewer's attention, your eye as the viewer around the picture. And so the next thing that we're gonna do is right click on the photo. And this time we're gonna use our auto mask. So the, the auto mask is a brush function, a brush tool. I actually wanna show you this twice because whereas the gradient is relatively safe, self-explanatory and we're gonna talk a lot about control points, uh, this auto mask tool, it can take a little getting used to. And what, what I'm gonna do is basically make a selection by clicking and brushing um, the, the actual broom that, that the woman is holding here or leaning against. Uh, we're gonna make a sort of not so great selection and the idea is that this, this tool, this function, is going to select out just the thing that we want. Now, it's not always sure exactly what we want, um, and we can make some really nice 
uh, controlled adjustments to where the effect is. But let's just see what happens when I make this kind of broad, not so great brush selection over uh, that broom. So I'm going to move into the color, or sorry, the light adjustments, and I'm going to just go ahead and take the exposure down. And as I do this, you can see it does do a pretty nice job just selecting out that um, that broom. And it's not perfect. And let's say if I bring my exposure way, way down, let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, you can get a sense of what's happening here. In fact, if you want to see the mask of any of these tools, whether it be the gradient or the control point, you just have to activate the thing in which the mask you want to look at. In this case, it's the auto uh, brush, the auto mask. And you click the show masks button or checkbox that's here towards the center of the interface. And, and this, what this is doing is it's showing us the actual full mask, not necessarily what is being selected. And it's doing that because if we needed to erase some of this effect, uh, we can actually go in and control that. So let's turn off the mask for just a second. You can see what the what is being affected and what's not being affected, right? I can see part of the door has some of the adjustment, um, part of her dress has some of the adjustment, and, and right back in here. And I don't want that filter, this, this density adjustment, even though we're not gonna leave it at this density, this brightness, uh, we, I don't want it to affect these areas. So what I'm gonna do is uh, move into the lower left corner here, and um, I can hold, sorry, I have to hold the, uh, Hmm, my tool's not coming up, there we go. I have to hold the Option key down on a Mac, or if you're on a PC, you hold Alt down. And this is where, you know, if you're taking notes, take this one, um, hold the Option key down on a Mac, and uh, this prompt comes up so that you can control the size, the feather, the flow, and the opacity of your eraser. But basically, I'm able to go in here and uh, erase my, my effect out. Let's, I'm going to close this for a second because it's not responding as it normally does. It's not even letting me get out of that. So I'm going to click close. Hmm. How funky. I, I wonder if my system froze. I'm going to give this a second. I'm also going to check my go to webinar control panel because this whole system isn't really working very well. Can Can everyone hear me pretty well still? Are there any problems with the connection? I don't, I'm sorry to ask, but um, the computer. Okay, Arthur, thank you very much. Okay, so we seem like we're good to go. Sounds fine. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. My The whole system was kind of starting to blow up. The fan was turning on. And I really didn't understand why I'm not able to um, brush this out. Size. So um, my brush isn't switching. Okay, we're going to start this one over because I don't know why that's happening. So uh, I'm going to go in with my right click. Yep, that's weird. New mask. My hand tool is on. Instead of my actual local adjustments tool. That's what was happening. I, apparently I had exited out of my, my local adjustments. So I go to my auto mask. Apologies for that. And um, I'm going to go ahead and just brush that in again. Do a little bit better of a job there. Let's darken the density down quite a bit. It's doing a nicer job here. In fact, I now I don't have anything in the dress to erase, so I'm going to purposefully brush over this so that you can get a sense of what's happening. Uh, I'm going to hold the Option key down on my Mac, and then or Alt if I'm on a PC. And as I do that, I can actually go in and, and very selectively erase sections that are being adjusted uh, that we might not want. So as I'm holding the option key down, holding option, I'm just brushing over the edge of that smart or auto mask. Um, and I don't have to be very specific here. And so that's one of the beauties of this uh, because the auto mask does a nice job of, of creating this mask selection for us. I just needed to clean it off of the areas where I knew I didn't want it to be affecting uh, and it was. So in this case now we've got our adjustment and again, the, the way that I got into that feature was I initially uh, painted over the uh, broom here. And then to erase the effect out, I hold the Option key down. And the Option key is going to give me the ability to change the size of my brush. 
So I can make it huge or small. I can change the feather, which is the hardness of the brush. You can see that reflected as I click and drag the feather. Uh, the flow and the opacity. Right, so we can adjust all of those things. So we can be very, very specific with this auto mask. And that's really quite wonderful um, because if in certain situations when like the control point doesn't do what you want it to do, you can use this auto mask and it's gonna do a really nice job. And so basically what I did here of just you know within this little um, broom, if we click the compare button, is I darkened down the density a little bit so he burned it down just a touch, and then I changed the color a little bit as well. And I, I did that, I cooled it down just a little bit to kind of make the, the broom stand off of our um, brightly colored subject, sort of on the opposite end of the color spectrum with this green and blue. Now we've got this orange uh, in her red garb there. So if we wanted to go in and adjust her, again, my goal as I hit Command minus, is to direct your attention as the viewer in towards our subject. So from here, I'm gonna add another control point. So I'm just gonna right click, so our heads up display comes up, click on the control point button here, and then just add a control point in her dress, size it so that I'm only encompassing her dress, and then I might make my first few adjustments. Now it gets a little, it takes a little getting used to when using these control points. Right, and in fact, this this is almost too easy of a um, of, of a subject to adjust because she her this orange especially stands off of the background so well. So uh, that one's not really fair for showing you sort of the capabilities. As we move through some of the other images, uh, you'll get a better sense of of how good these control points can, can respond. Uh, one thing I do wanna do is see if we can get a little sharpness back into the subject's face, because from far away, uh, the image looks pretty sharp, but when we zoom in, you can see I, I must have missed focused at a relatively short depth of field. So I'm gonna click the new mask button down here. That's gonna give me the opportunity to um, do the same thing and so much as hopefully Oh, it exited me out of local adjustments again. I wonder if there's a bug or something. Anyways, um, I wanna make a selection of our subject's face. And then this time, I'm gonna move into the detail section. And let's see if we can increase the sharpness of her face. So I'm gonna bring it all the way up to 100. I think that's gonna be too much. Like it's gonna look a little bit funky. Actually didn't do too awful much here. I might need to find an edge. Give it a second to catch up. I'm gonna dodge her face just a little bit, add a little bit of contrast and add just a touch of micro contrast and uh, the clear view plus. And so here we're gonna get just a little bit more detail and texture um, out of the subject's face. In fact, let's look at the compare button to actually see what's happening here. There's the before, it's pretty soft. And there's the after. And so we, it doesn't bring it completely into sharp focus, unfortunately. We probably need to use um, something more like Sharpener Pro 3, and we could probably get a lot more texture out of her skin. Maybe if we have enough time at the end of the webinar, we can do that. Um, but those are the three of the four controls within uh, the DxO Photo Lab. The, the last control that you have, as I right click, is simply a brush tool. And the brush tool is quite a nice brush because you, you have all of those same capabilities. You can adjust the size, the feather, the flow and opacity that you see in the lower left corner here. Um, the, the difference between this tool and that smart brush, the edge detection brush uh, that we were just messing with is that I have to be a lot more precise as to where I brush this in. And in fact, if I'm going to be using this tool or if I'm gonna use the, um, the brush tool that's built into the NIC plugins, uh, I recommend utilizing a Wacom tablet, which is a pen tablet system that basically just allows you to be much more precise with where you're putting the adjustment, right? Because right now I just kind of painted the upper left corner. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, burn that whole corner. It, it doesn't look terribly photographic because I wasn't very precise um, in making my selection. Uh, the brush tool can be a huge, huge, wonderful tool to use, a very important tool in a digital workflow. Um, but what I tend to lean on 
especially when I'm within uh, Photo Lab, is these control points and then the auto mask brush and gradients from time to time as well, because they just make my life easy. I can just, you know, draw a line. It creates a nice gradient. It's as simple as that. Um, but that having the brush tool is sort of like you, you have to have it because the brush tool can do some other things than the auto brush maybe would be frustrating to do and then the uh, control point capability as well anyways we're all done editing our image here i'm going to click the close button let's just take one quick look at the before and after in fact let's uh, let's see a side by side so um, i've clicked on the the split preview that's in the upper portion of the interface here we can click on the center line and go from the original image to our enhanced image. And actually you can see my brush line that I've created there. So not super refined in that regard. But now I'm able to kind of direct the viewer's attention through the photograph. And I've kind of told you what's important by lightening, dodging the areas that I find are more important and sort of burning down or darkening down um, the areas that are maybe less important. Cool. So I'm gonna jump over into the GoToWebinar control panel, make sure we're all good to go still. Okay. All right, we've got a couple comments coming in. I'm going to save those for the end of the webinar here. Okay, Colin said my audio has dropped out a couple of times, but it seems to have come back. All right. Apologies if our connection isn't terribly good. So I love using this picture for webinars um, or this image for webinars uh, because it, it allows me to show you what a lot of these control point capabilities are doing. In fact, um, if I, I've just went into the local adjustments and I'm going to go click on the brightest sort of blue color over here. And I'm not sure, let's, let's click on new mask. Oh, not new mask. What am I doing? I want to click on show mask. And what this is doing is it's illustrating to us what is being affected by this control point. Now it, it partially doesn't make sense because this is not a photograph that, that folks are going to be doing image processing on post-processing. But as I click on my control point, you can see if I click and drag it, exactly what's being affected and how it's being affected. Now, what we're leaving out in this case is um, the texture part because what we're dealing with with this file is just color and light. Right? It's just density, brightness levels, and color levels. So the control point, if it had textures as well, it would make an even better selection. But anything you see lit up is what would be affected by the control point, affected by the control point. And anything you see that's not lit up by the control point as I move it around, right, is not. Huh, interesting. Anyways. I like showing this because it kind of displays what's happening when you drop a control point, or better yet, when you size the area of influence. So you see how now as I build that area of influence out, as I click on this and slide it outward away, what I'm saying is that I want this control point to make a bigger selection of this area. And so the other thing it does is sort of like lessens its tolerance, right? So it reaches out further to other colors because I've now expanded the size of the area of influence. And that, that comes into play more when we take a look at another photograph um, as we move through our demonstration. But I'm gonna click close here. Uh, let's move into, let's actually just move into this picture here. Um, and, and let's take a look at what we can do with some control points. So the first thing that I need to do here is a, a little bit of exposure compensation. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, click into the exposure compensation tool. And I'm going to use a preset that's built into the exposure compensation tool, uh, the highlight priority strong. And what that's gonna do is it's really gonna darken down the image. So it brought my image down about two stops, right? And in the, with the intention of retaining highlight detail. So if you follow me to the histogram in the upper right here, if I turn that tool off, you'll see a lot of stuff is basically shoved up against the right side of the histogram, which is indicating to us that we're losing or likely clipping a good amount of information. As we uh, click the exposure compensation, now I'm retaining that highlight information, but I've created a really like low key dark photograph. So I don't want that in this case. So I'm gonna go into the selective tone section and I'm just gonna take uh, my blacks slider and my shadows slider up a bit 
to try and get some of that texture and detail back in those areas. The problem that I'm gonna run into now though, is that I've really sort of messed up my contrast range because now I'm retaining my highlight detail, but I don't have any really nice dark shadow tones. So I've gotta be careful as to what I do with these uh, selective tone adjustments, which by the way, this, this tool here, selective tone just means we are breaking out and able to control the highlights separate from the midtones, separate from the shadows, separate from the blacks, but they are global adjustments, which means they're affecting the entire picture. So if I wanted to make these kinds of adjustments, I would then move into my local adjustments and start kind of honing in on the areas that, that need a little love. So in this case, I'm gonna use the auto mask one more time, just cause it's handy. I don't have to worry about the selection too much. I just have to go over the areas that I wanna control. I'm gonna go over this area as well. The more precise I am with my brush, the better, but for demonstration purposes, I can show you that it doesn't really matter, right? Because if I really darken this down, it goes and finds the little inner workings of the grass there, and it finds the edge of that little thing the, the, where the mud is sort of coming out. I'm not gonna leave this that dark, obviously, but it is nice because now I can control that stuff individually really quickly and easily and get my contrast back and my micro contrast back in my foreground. And I'm just gonna click new mask from there and voila. Now I have a nice density down there. Um, I'm gonna just add a control point into the darker portions. It, my mask turned on, so it's showing the mask. I'm gonna turn that off by clicking the show mask button. And we're just gonna go ahead and darken down those trees there just to give us our contrast range back. I think one more control point here with some uh, micro contrast would be nice just to direct your eye as the viewer. And then I think the only thing I would need to do on this image to kind of finish it off, because I want it to look natural and clean, but I also would like to direct your attention sort of towards the, the this is a road, it's a flooded road. Um, I want to sort of draw your attention towards the sign where if we saw this full resolution, you can actually get a better sense of that. Um, I think we would just use a little bit of a vignette, but for the sake of time, we're going to keep moving. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and jump over into Photoshop. So everything that we've done today, we've done within Photolab, but whether you launch from Photoshop or Lightroom or Photolab or whatever other host piece of software you might be utilizing, um, these these functions work the same way within the NIC plugins. So the control points that we were using so far have been Photolab control points, but the control points that are built into the NIC collection are going to work exactly the same way. So let's in this case go into SilverFX Pro, and as that launches, I'll just let you know that one of the differences of these control points is that each piece of software does something different. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and just hide silver effects for just a second. If you follow me here to the Nick Selective tool, Define 2.0 is a noise reduction software. So the control points that are built into Define allow you to control how much or how little noise reduction you're doing selectively, right? HDR effects, I'm gonna skip over a couple of them. HDR effects Pro, is a high dynamic range image processor. So basically it allows you to take a, you know, an exposure series, multiple images and merge them together into an HDR photograph. But the control points allow you to selectively control light and color, brightness levels, contrast levels, kind of like the ones that we had within Photolab, they just look a little bit different. SilverFX Pro, which is the software we just opened up into, is a black and white conversion tool. And so the control points make their selections the same way as they did within Photolab, as they basically would do within Define or HDR. But here in Silver Effects, we have control over the things you would adjust for black and white processing, black and white image editing. So the control points have brightness, contrast, and structure by default. And then there's a little triangle here. And if you click on that little triangle, it expands into uh, amplify whites, amplify blacks, fine structure, and then even selective colorization. So if you wanted to get the color back in the blue sky or on um, the building here, you can just place the control point on the building or in the blue sky, and then take your selective colorization slider all the way up into the right. That's not what we're here to learn. What we're here to learn are some techniques with these control points. So 
Uh, first things first, let's talk about uh, constructive or a constricting control point and an adjustment control point. Technically, they are exactly the same thing. But basically, um, if I were to go in and adjust, uh, you know, let's say the building. So I placed the control point on the building and I placed it in here. And what it's doing is it's going in and darkening down a lot of areas as I've taken the brightness slider down. But this control point is also affecting some other areas that I really don't want it to control. So what I'm going to do is set another control point on one of the areas that this point is affecting that we don't want this point to affect. And the new control point will make a selection of that area and remove the effect of this control point. In fact, instead of just saying that, I'm going to do it. So follow me over to the right side of the interface here. I'm going to expand into the control points section. Right now I've got one control point, so only one point shows up in our list. But if I click the little checkbox that's on the far right side of the control points list, that's going to illustrate to us our selection that this control point is making. Anything that is white is being selected by this control point. Anything that is black is not being selected by this control point. And anything that's gray depends on the, the tone of that gray. It might be being affected a little bit, right? So you can see in a couple areas of the image where, uh, like in here, there's a there's this kind of a gradient. This area is not being affected at all. This area a little bit, and then these lighter areas are being affected more by that control point. I don't want this control point to affect any of these detailings in the facade or any of these areas. So what we're going to do is just take another point, place it on those objects, and now you can see how that got sort of a richer tone of black, got even darker. That's because the first control point is no longer affecting that area so much. And basically, the more control points you add, the smarter each individual control point gets. Now, you don't want to go you know, uh, crazy and add 50 control points to areas because it feels like that's going to make a better selection. It's not, probably. Uh, the, the, you want to use kind of as few a control points as you can to still get the kind of honed in selection that you want. And I'll also tell you that I don't, I, I trust this mask method, right? Being able to see and, and, uh, get a feel for exactly where these control points are affecting is really nice. I don't really use this function that often. What I tend to do is I, I turn it on and off for demonstration purposes, and I also look at it from time to time to see exactly what's happening. But like in this case, I'm going to go ahead and just darken down these details a lot and add a little bit of contrast and then amplify the whites. So I've got a really dramatic adjustment from this control point. Um, I didn't even or can't even see the fact that it's affecting some of these areas of the lighter toned marble or stone rather, right? You can if you toggle it on and off. And if you don't want that, again, what you would do is put these constricting control points in. So I place a point here, I place a point here, I'm losing some of the texture and detail that I really love in this area, so I could take another control point and place it in here, but watch what happens as soon as I do this. Right? See how it lightened up pretty dramatically? And that's because this control point, the first one that was making that really dramatic adjustment, is no longer in control of this area. I've told this control point to affect this area. So now I need to actually go in and massage the tones exactly how I want them to be here. Basically, though, the more control points you add, the smarter each control point gets. But again, be careful not to add too many control points because they can start to conflict and you're not going to end up with the desired result. Um, it, the problem with that statement, though, is that it's completely image dependent and it's completely dependent upon the adjustment that you're making um, as well. So uh, one more trick. Let's say we drop a control point in the sky. Right, and we want to, let's say we wanted to dodge that sky. I'm going to bring these tones back up because they're way too dark for that section of the image. I like the added contrast. I like the added sort of structure and tones, but uh, I want to burn the sky a whole bunch. And so I want to make sure that my building can kind of stand off of that a little bit. So uh, if we wanted to, let's say, burn, uh, darken down the entire sky, we could take one control point and expand that out. 
right? And that's going to do it for us, and it does a pretty good job for us. Uh, but look what happens if we go look at that selection. I think, yeah, this control point is actually affecting the grass down here a little bit, these trees a little bit, and then the facade of the building a little bit. And we don't really want that. So one trick that we've sort of developed when utilizing these control points is to actually use several small duplicate control points and you'll end up with better results. And we can even group those control points together so that we can control them all at once. So for now, I'm gonna turn off the selection. So we're gonna hide the selection of that control point. Uh, you can see when I place this control point in the upper left, upper right corner of the image, it doesn't, it doesn't look particularly good. It kind of looks like now we've just got this really darkened down corner. But uh, once we start duplicating these points, and dropping them into the areas where I know I want the uh, sort of burned down sky, I can get a really beautiful sense of, of tone in here. And basically what I'm doing to duplicate these control points, I'm holding the option key down on a Mac or Alt if I'm on a PC. And while I'm holding it down, I'm just gonna click and drag. So it's option, click and drag, option, click and drag. And, and what I like to do or what I tend to do is kind of make sure that the, the area of influence is uh, around or at least very close to the next and previous control point, right? So you'll see some overlap and you'll see, um, in this case, very little overlap. It's basically those points are right at the ends of the areas. But by doing this, the, the software can kind of understand that this is all one giant object basically, and we're affecting it with this duplicate control point. But now kind of what's funky is we've got like 10 control points on the sky. And if we wanted to control all of them at once, I'd have to, I'd have to group them, right? Because right now they're all individual control points. So to group these points, I have to uh, turn them all on slash activate the control points. And I can activate one point at a time by just clicking on it. Or I can activate multiple control points by holding the shift key down on my keyboard and then clicking on each individual control point. Or I can actually click anywhere that is not on a control point. So I'm clicking and holding my cursor or my uh, mouse down and I can drag. So click and drag and I can highlight multiple control points at one time. So there are two different ways of highlighting multiple control points. Hold shift, click on each individual control point and or um, just click and drag anywhere that's not on a point and then encompass all of the control points within that bounding box. Now I've activated all these points. You can see that they're active over here on the control points list, but what I wanna do is group them. So I come to the bottom of the control points list and I click this group button here, and now they're all grouped together. So anything I do to the one sort of master point, it's going to affect all of them at once. Um, again, if I need a constricting control point, because the, the control points in the sky were kind of affecting um, our grass down here, we might go and stick a couple constricting control points down there. I'm going to place one point. Um, another shortcut that was really handy to pick up and learn uh, is Shift Command A. Shift Command A, hitting or Shift Control A if you're on a PC. Um, oops, by hitting that all at once, you get this crosshair and you can basically create a new control point without having to go over to the right side of the interface. You just hit Shift Command A, gives you a little crosshair. You can click and uh, drop your control point where you want it to be. Very cool. All right, so I'm gonna click the OK button in the lower right corner of the interface. That's gonna bring us back over into our host software, which in this case was Photoshop. I wanna show you the brush tool next because we're, we're gonna run low on time in just a few minutes here. Um, but before I do that, we're here in Photoshop, we have our original background layer, and now we have our Silver Effects Pro layer up above the background layer of original pixels. So you can toggle those on and off, and then you can also utilize any layer, layer masks, blending modes, those sorts of things that you might use in Photoshop um, with these Nick plugins. Really quite nice. All right, so Photolab. Let's, um, let's use this shoot yeah you know what let's use this image so we're going to take this photograph over into photoshop i want to show you the um 
the brush capability that's built into the Photoshop version of the software. So uh, I need to export this image from Photolab over into Photoshop. To do that, I move to the lower right corner of the interface and say export to application. This is gonna bring up another dialogue, which just asks me exactly how I wanna send, where I wanna send the image to. So I'm gonna bring it over to Photoshop and uh, how I wanna send it at these different settings. So these are my default settings and I think I just changed ICC profile from sRGB to 1998 at that point. We can work in either one for, for our web webinar here. I'm gonna click export and then I'm gonna take a sip from my tea and that's gonna open for just a second. I'll jump over into Photoshop. As that launches, I'll take a look at our GoToWebinar control panel. Cool, we've got a couple comments coming in. I'm gonna save these questions uh, for the end of the webinar, but um, how do you connect DxO Photo Lab to a Wacom tablet? Jack, the, um, as far as I know, the Wacom tablet, as long as you've got the right driver installed, when you plug the USB into your computer, or if you're using it wirelessly, because a lot of Wacom tablets do that, um, it should have pen pressure capability. DxO's PhotoLab 3 should be working just fine without anything special. You just need the standard um, Wacom driver set. Okay, good questions. So this time uh, I wanna show you the brush tool. And um, for demonstration purposes, actually I could have just used the other image now that I think of it, but for demonstration purposes, I wanna show you the brush tool with Silver Effects Pro. Um, I, I do use a technique with brush tool and silver effects, but not this technique. The, the reason I wanna show you the brush tool with um, silver effects is it's just really easy to see the difference between um, the, the black and white conversion and the original color image. So in this case, I'm just gonna go and click on a preset. Let's say, uh, I'm gonna to go to the in vogue presets. Let's see what we got here. Ominous fade. Cool. I like what that's doing. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of the grain that's on there. If there is any grain, oops, I went way too far. Film adjustments, film types. Get rid of the grain. And then rather than just clicking the uh, OK button in the lower right corner, as I did a minute ago, which would just apply the effect to the whole image, I'm gonna click the brush tool. So this brush capability is only available for the Photoshop version of the NIC plugins. And that's because what we're doing with this brush tool is using layers and layer masks within Photoshop. It's just we access the layer painting effects using the tools palette within the NIC selective tool, right? So for those who are familiar with layers and layer masks, you, you don't even really need to use this tool because you have a layer mask on your image. So don't worry about it if you're already using brush capabilities. But if you've never used the brush tool from the NIC plugins, this or, or you don't use layers and layer masks in Photoshop, this could be a really cool feature. So what you do is you can um, fill the effect in. So if I click fill, it's gonna fill the entire layer mask in. And now we have our ominous fade preset that we used from uh, Silver FX Pro. If I click the clear button, it clears the entire layer mask. And therefore, we have none of the NIC collection adjustment applied. If I click the paint button, this basically gives me a, a paint brush tool where I can control uh, the size of my brush using the brush tool here in Photoshop. Um, I've, I've actually just expanded or made the brush bigger using my right bracket tool. And um, I need to change the opacity. So all of these settings, this should be set to 100 opacity by default. And basically, if I just go and paint this in, I can have you know half of the image be black and white or half of it be in color. Again, I don't, I wouldn't, there are certain situations where this might work with a black and white image like this, um, but I just simply wanted to show you how this paint tool is working, or if you click erase, you can erase the effect out of certain areas. I'm gonna give you one more workflow that might be more uh, realistic. It's just this paint erase feature is easy to show with the black and white, right? Because we can paint this in wherever we want. Um, okay, clear. Um, and I'm just going to say discard. 
because I wanted to show you an initial effect here. So from here, let's move into, I don't know, Color Effects Pro. Let's do that. And we're going to click into Color Effects Pro, and I'm going to use a Film Effects Nostalgic Filter. And I might as well show you the control points that are built into Color Effects, because um, the control points in Photo Lab, what those are doing for us is allowing us to control light, color, and sharpness. The control points within uh, Silver FX Pro, the black and white conversion software, allows you to control the, the brightness and contrast because you're dealing with black and white. So there's no color. It, there's no color that's being rendered in the image. The, the color image is being utilized by Silver FX Pro, even though we don't see it necessarily. Um, and the difference here between Color FX Pro and Silver FX is that Color FX Pro is a collection of 55 individual filters. And those 55 individual filters all do their own thing. And then the control points allow you to put that thing in or take that thing out. Meaning, if I wanted this cross-processing to be removed from the sky, I would take a minus control point from the right side of the interface, place that point on the right on, on the image itself, expand around the sky, or maybe use my technique with these smaller control points. It's not necessarily my technique. I should say the technique. It's just another way of doing it. It's, I didn't invent it. Uh, but basically, I've removed the effect from the sky, but I still have the effect of our cross-processing on this tree and on the rest of the image. And we can keep going with that. So I've added the cross-processing filter to just certain portions of the image. Um, I can go ahead and uh, increase the amount. So if I bring that strength slider up, but I can also decrease the opacity of the control point, right? So I placed a plus control point down here in the red rocks, and I've sized the area of influence that is the circle they, that, that we're indicating how big the area is that we want this control point to affect. And then we can also control the strength of that control point. So I can take this opacity slider and I can drop it down to zero. And now effectively we've just made this plus control point into a minus control point. Uh, but we can also just bring this up to whatever setting we want. And in this case, I like 100% on this image. It kind of skews the colors in an interesting way. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna leave that. But your control points in color effects are basically going to give you the ability to put the effect in in an area where you want it and take the effect out in areas where you don't want it. I'm going to add, let's, I wonder what happens if we use the Indian Summer filter. Not much. Yeah. Nothing really. The Indian Summer filter basically take, turns foliage from green, green and yellow to red. But let's say we love what we're getting here. Right, we're taking the image from the original look, which was this, to uh, our finalized look, which is this. In fact, let's add one more filter. And um, let's use, uh, we're gonna leave it at that. There's so many things that we could do, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna click the brush button in the uh, lower right corner here. And this time, this is probably more like a workflow that I might use this, this brush tool for, uh, as opposed to the silver effects technique. Uh, that I showed you a minute ago. I don't, to each his own, but typically if I turn an image black and white, I turn the whole thing black and white. Um, there are some interesting brushing techniques that you can use with silver effects with multiple layers of black and white conversions. Uh, but in our case, I just wanted to show you the technique. So I love what's happening on the foreground of the image, in the rocks especially. I don't particularly like it in um, some of the grass in the in the closest portion of the foreground or in the trees. So what I've done is I've clicked the paint button and I'm just painting the effect in where I know I want it to be. Again, a Wacom tablet would be helpful because I could be even more precise. Okay, got it. Um, so, but what I wanna do is click the erase button and I wanna erase the effect off of some of these areas. So I don't want it in um, this part of the foliage and by taking it out, I think it's just kind of uh, making this effect a little bit more precise, and it's directing your attention into these greens and yellows a little bit more because their contrast and color stand out now. They're a little bit heavier, if you will, um, than with this other post-processing applied to it. 
So uh, it would be smart to be using a Wacom tablet because if I click the apply button on the sort of lower right portion of the selective tool, I'm going to minimize the selective tool and bring you over into the layer mask section here of Photoshop. So first of all, watch the before and after, and we really only are affecting the lower half of this image, but here's the before and here's the after. So I'm able to paint that effect in exactly where we want it to be. Um, but we're also able to use this layer mask capability. And so if I wanted to see that layer mask, I can do that a couple different ways here in Photoshop. Um, I can kind of turn on a quick mask by hitting the um, backslash key that's underneath the delete button on your keyboard. So you're seeing the mask with this red overlay. Um, or if I, here we go, if I hold the option key down on a Mac or Alt on a PC, and I click directly on the layer mask here within Photoshop, um, you can see the exact layer mask that I've made. And it's not a very photographic clean mask. So a, a Wacom tablet would help me with that because I could actually hone in exactly where I'm putting the effect. But I will point out the fact that your selections only need to be precise as they need to be. Which means if you're going to take this image and you're gonna put it on the web, at this resolution, at this like size screen, the selections and adjustments we've made are fine. If we were going to make a giant print of this at full resolution, so let's zoom all the way into full res, 100%, um, it might be a good idea to be a little bit more precise than what our mask looks like, right? Because when, when we're printing, um, and especially printing at this sort of large of a size, this would be like a at least a 24 inch print, um, precision becomes imperative, right? You, we just need to be more precise because the idea here is that we do the post-processing and direct the viewer's attention around the image as much as necessary, but we generally, in photographic terms, we, we're trying to hide or, or not make it obvious that we've made these kinds of adjustments. Now, there might be some conceptual photographers out there that make their post-processing blatantly obvious, but let's say for this landscape image, I don't I don't want viewers to, um, I, I don't care if they know that I've done post-processing, but I don't want the image to um, to scream and, and have, um, let's say, signatures or aberrations because of the post-processing that I'm doing. And so being relatively precise and clean with the selections I'm making is gonna be important. And that's why working with control points is such a, a, a wonderful thing, as they go and initially make their really beautiful selection for you, and then you can hone it in using the brush tool like this. Or if you're within Photo Lab, uh, you, you can use your control points and a brush and the gradient tool sort of all at once or all on the same image if necessary. And then even erase out um, you know, different effects from different control points and gradients as necessary using the eraser tool. So it's a really nice feature set in that regard. Um, and in you know using the Nick plugins, you have that capability of utilizing the brush tool in tandem with your control points. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that's my hour. Um, that's going to be the end of the demonstration portion of the webinar. So I greatly appreciate everybody coming out to this webinar. Hopefully you found this to be beneficial. Learn a little bit more about some of the selective editing tools that you've got built into Photo Lab 3 and into the Nick collection. Um, I am going to go ahead and transition into the Q&A. So if, if you have questions, and I've got a couple that are in the queue right now. I'm going to try and walk through them. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the questions box. I'm going to kind of try to go through these. Um, the Clearview Plus is available in the Elite version, right? Not in the Essential version. In this case, uh, with the smart lighting as well. Okay, uh, Pascal, good question. So the Clearview Plus capability is built into Photo Lab 2 and Photo Lab 3 Elite. Um, I, I don't think it's actually built into the essential version, which is the, the version of the software that you get included with the Nick collection. So good, good point. You'd have to, those were for folks that um, own the Elite version um, or are interested in knowing more about it. Uh, there's one tool that I didn't get an opportunity to show. So uh, it's the select or the color selection tool. It's actually under HSL. 
And um, I wonder if this image would be a good one to show that. So let me jump into that for just a second before we go into our Q&A, because it is a tool that's really quite beautiful. And uh, it's down here in the color section. So I've scrolled on, in PhotoLab 3 down into the color section. And this is in PhotoLab 3 specifically. This is one of the new features. Uh, what it allows you to do is control the saturation, luminance, and, and color uniformity of uh, the different portions, colors, uh, and color channels. So if I go into, let's say, the blue section here, so I've clicked on blue, and what's happening is this is the default blue color that the software is reaching into. So if I go in and add saturation, maybe dense, darken down the density a little bit, um, this can create some really interesting controls because of um, how this is affecting the image. But the saturation, luminance, and, and uniformity are all kind of uh, standard tools that you might see in other pieces of software. But the way that you control HSL is really quite interesting here because we can tell the software how far into blue or how far into other colors we actually want our adjustment to, to go. Right. So let's say in blue that looks pretty good, but if we move into the yellow and then I, let's say, increase the saturation of yellow, I might decide that I actually want my yellow adjustments to reach further into orange. So I'll go ahead and drag that Oop, too far. And then I'll go ahead and drag this over. And I think I've added too much saturation now, but you get a sense of what's happening. In fact, let's, let's go ahead and increase the saturation completely and watch what happens as I reach out into other colors. So now more of the colors in this portion of the color spectrum that I've told the software to affect are being affected by this adjustment. As I slide this back, I can kind of hone in on the very precise or specific yellows that I might want to control. So I like it right there. That looks pretty good. It's still way too much saturation, but I love the fact that I can go in and individually kind of uh, control these, these channels, right? And we can, we can affect this image in an interesting way uh, without having to make you know, these local adjustment tools do any work. We're doing it with a global color adjustment tool. We're just spe like specifying um, exactly which colors are being affected by our saturation, luminance, and uniformity. Anyways, that's a quick intro into the um, HSL tool, which I wanted to show and kind of ran out of time doing that. Oh, interesting. Dave, you, I'll, I'll look into stats menu, stat menus, which gives you a quick bar that, that allows you to see. Your, I, I actually used to have the, the Apple one on, but Dave, I, I don't have that. And I don't know if I'm familiar with stat menus. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google that one. Uh, Chris, you said you use uh, the Windows versions of PhotoLab 3. Is there a way you can control the size or feather and flow on the menus displayed? Yes. So, Chris, um, if you are within the local adjustment, so the question is, I think anyways, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, if you are in um, a brush tool, for example, or the auto brush, and you want to control this tool, so it pops up or it changes by holding the um, option button. Uh, Chris, and, and actually, if it's not coming up, I think you just have to click on the brush settings button, which is in the lower left corner. So basically, to access those tools, you, you click on that while you're in the brush tool, click on brush settings, and you should be able to control size, feather, flow, and opacity. Um, another question that we got was in regards to flow. So flow, like watch my mask, the flow is at 100% right now as I sort of click and drag, right? So you can see it's nice and smooth, and it's all kind of equally applied or all equally brushed in, if you will. If I lower my flow down to like 30% or something and I brush this, what, what happens uh, is, is it's, a, it's not necessarily a lower opacity. And if I'm using a Wacom tablet, it actually does something slightly different than this. But it, it's basically how, if, if you think of, let's say, like a um, aerosol spray, like, um, wow. Spray paint, for example. If you press the, the the head down to spray the spray paint out, if you press it really hard, it comes out at 100% flow, 
right? It comes out entirely. Whereas if you don't press it so hard or you modulate your finger as you change pressure, uh, you'll get a different flow. And that's basically what's going on with this flow slider. And opacity is sort of like the overall um, opacity of the adjustment that you're putting on. So um, lowering the opacity, you've got to like click and uh, click on an object a bunch of times to kind of like paint the effect in very subtly, right? And depending upon where you put that opacity, you'll get a different amount per click, right? So the opacity is per click, 30% per click as I've gone to 33% opacity. I haven't actually made any adjustments here. There, perfect, that's beautiful. All right, so we've got that one. No audio problems. Uh, are edits saved in the NEF file as a sidecar? Yes, possibly a great question. So um, th this is parametric image editing and all of these effects that we've put on this image, let's say if I jump back over into this photograph, um, any of the adjustments that we've made, I'm gonna just close out of this, right? Any of the adjustments that we made here will be saved via a sidecar file specific to Photolab. Um, and then also any of the local adjustments that you've made. So we can actually come back into these control points and adjust them as we see fit. It's really pretty wonderful. Um, Dave, I think I missed the beginning of your question about control points and clicking on them. Uh, Jill was wondering if the NIC plugins are different in Photoshop. No. So I didn't actually show you how to access the NIC plugins from Photolab. To do that, you would click on this button in the lower right corner of Photolab, and a prompt comes up and it asks you which piece of software you want to launch into. But once you launch into the NIC plugin, it's almost identical whether you're launching from Photoshop or if you're launching from Lightroom in Photolab 3 or Photolab 2. Good question. Michael, yes. So Michael was wondering, uh, he's updated to the newest Lightroom and you're not able to access the NIC plugins. You're on a Mac, have you heard of this problem? Yeah, I. so I have that problem right now, Michael, and I have not reached out to um, NIC software to figure out what it is, or DxO specifically to figure out what, what that problem is. I've just been using it from Photolab instead of going into um, Lightroom. But um, there, there, I don't know if it's a, if it's an update error or if it's a folder problem, like where the NIC plugins are installed on your Mac and Lightroom can't find them or exactly what it is. I don't, I don't know what the problem is, but I have noticed that same thing. I wonder if anyone else, is anyone else a Lightroom user uh, and having the same problem where they can't access the NIC plugins? Just out of curiosity, I don't think I'm gonna be able to fix anything, but I'm wondering if anybody else out there is having that problem. Thanks, Martin. Bart? Thank you for the kind words, and Tom as well. Oh, okay. So hopefully Tom didn't leave before I showed that new color tool. I showed a little bit. Very good. Um, oh, iStat menu. Thank you, Dave. iStat menu. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that. Google it. Uh, there does seem to be a bug in Photolab that causes the local adjustments to close in Windows occasionally. Stuart, interesting. That was what was just happening to me. I hadn't seen that before, though. And of course, these problems are going to occur when I'm on a webinar, right? Not when I'm just using the software, but definitely when I'm live on a webinar. Stuart, thanks for letting me know. Cool. Chris, very good. Glad, glad to hear it. Um, Let's see, so Dave, you're saying it was an alternate method to select control points rather than from the image itself, they can be selected using the same shift click technique on the side car control panel. Yes, great point, Dave. Um, great point, actually. Let's, I'm gonna show one more thing. I mean, I'm probably gonna show a couple more things if more questions come in. But Dave just mentioned a good point in Photoshop using, in, not even in Photoshop, just using the NIC collection. Doesn't matter whether you're launching from Photoshop or Lightroom or, um, photo lab or anything. But the, the statement that Dave made was another way of selecting control points, not on the image. So when I showed you, let's click on dark glow. So we'll use the dark glow preset and let's just drop some control points. It doesn't really matter where they are or what they're doing in this case. I'm gonna put one here and one there. 
Okay, so let's say I wanted to select out all three of these control points. I showed you the marquee function and then the shift click function, but Dave just mentioned a really good point, and that is if you wanted to highlight all of these, um, you can also highlight them by clicking on them and holding the shift button down in the control points list. So you do have to know which control points you're clicking on, but that's another way of activating multiple control points. But it's really quite easy to know which one's which because you can just turn them on and off. And then if there's an adjustment, you'll see it. And then you can also click on the mask selection. Great point, Dave. Uh, okay. And Mark just mentioned that Nick shows up fine in the, his up-to-date Lightroom. So um, it must just be us. Mm -hmm. Dave, thank you. I saw that link come in. Uh, how can I save my correction parameters in Color Effects Pro? So Herman, I'm not sure exactly of your question, but there is a way of saving presets. So you, you can um, apply those presets to images later on as well. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking for though. So let's go into Color Effects. My throat's getting dry. I'm gonna take a sip from my tea, pardon. I'm here in Rochester, New York, and the, it gets really dry in the winter, and I'm in a, a recording booth right now, so it's getting warm as well as I sit here. So um, Herman was just wondering, how do you save correction parameters in Color Effects Pro? The, the only way that you can really do it is to save a recipe, and what you would do is basically create your stack of filters. So I'm going to put on just a couple filters by randomly clicking and some Glamour Glow. Why the heck not? So let's say we love this. We want to apply this to more pictures afterwards, and this is our filter stack. Uh, what we would do is click the Save Recipe button in Color Effects Pro, and that's going to save this stack of filters with the specific settings that we've adjusted them to. I didn't actually make any specific adjustments, um, but those things would be recorded into this recipe as well. So I'm going to name this Dan Test. Click OK, and now my Dan Test somewhere is going to show up in my. Um, there it is, Dan Test, showing up in my um, custom recipes section. Herman, let me know if that's what you were looking for. Um, and so Dave, you were saying your version of three, okay. Oh, how odd. So Chris, you're saying that you can't export into Photoshop CC 2020, you can only export into 19 or 18. That's another one. So absolutely, Herman, my pleasure. So. As a disclaimer, I I do these webinars for D DxO Nick Software. I don't actually work for DxO Nick Software, so um, I I can ask about these things. Like I need to figure out why my plugins are not functioning properly in Lightroom. That is a problem, um, and it seems as though a couple other people who were here have seen that problem. There's other folks who have updated to the most recent version of Lightroom and have not had that version or have that problem. Uh, but Chris, you're having a different problem. Chris, you know, if you haven't done this already and you have access to your download link, um, down, you know, reinstall the newest version and restart the computer, obviously, too, once you've reinstalled it. Um, that, that might help, but there, there also could be something else funky going on there, in which case you'd want to reach out to uh, DxO. Okay, and, and Jack just mentioned that he has the latest version of um, Lightroom and the Nick plugins are working fine. So absolutely, Richard, my pleasure. Uh, cool, Catalina Island, I imagine you're saying, Jack? That's sweet, I've never been out there. Um, okay, Dave, I uh, love the Nick tools, it made a big difference in image processing, great flexibility. Yes, well, so Dave, the, the Nick plugins, I don't think we're functioning in the DxO software in 2011, but you know now you got them, so it's all good. And Chris will do, absolutely. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I don't see any more questions coming in. I, I greatly appreciate everybody coming out and spending their hour with me. Hopefully you found this to be a beneficial demonstration. My name's Dan Hughes. I'm gonna go ahead and sign off for today. Hopefully I see you again soon at another webinar. If I don't see you before the end of the year, happy holidays, happy new year, and I hope to see you. Um, in, the, in the coming months in these webinars. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye.